Joining me next is Jason Alba. Jason's a Pluralsight author who has been producing uh, a lot of courses that y- you maybe haven't run across in our library. They're in a section that we call professional development, and that's what we're here to talk about. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, you know, one of the biggest things we hear from IT people all the time is it's it's really hard to keep up with technology. Uh, we know that a lot of our subscribers spend, you know, 10 or more hours a month just trying to keep up with technology. So why would they maybe spend a little bit of that time on something other than technology? What, what are some of the reasons that this professional development stuff uh, should kind of be on their radar? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I know how hard it is to stay up with technology because I got phased out of technology. I remember sitting in a meeting where uh, I realized that I wasn't the technologist anymore. Um, but I've, I've been in plenty of meetings with IT people uh, in a management position, uh, in, in a board capacity, as a customer, and also as the IT technician. And I've seen te- I've seen people kind of lose a conversation, not because of what they knew or didn't know, but because really of their soft skills, the way they communicated, the way they connected with other people in the room. And, uh, and I think it's just really important that we complement what our technical abilities are with our ability to actually sell ourselves or sell the product or just create some sense of trust with the other people that we're communicating with. So, so we're not just technical cogs in a technical machine. We're also people. And I, I think that's a, a theme that I've kind of, you know, covered with people a little bit too. And, and you can tell me if this kind of fits, but you're, you're not just your job. You are also your career, which might involve more than your current job. And you've kind of got to make sure that you're you're thinking about that. And, and maybe, maybe I guess that's even with the same company. Um, you've done even some courses on career management and, and kind of working the corporate ladder a little bit. Tell me, tell me a little bit about how, how this professional development stuff can not only benefit your current job, but maybe, maybe facilitate a promotion. Well, yeah, hopefully it'll facilitate a promotion. You know, honestly, in today's world, the way that job security has become redefined, I think a lot of people are just hoping to keep their jobs Um, I I heard a statistic a number of years ago that we change jobs every two to five years. And when I first heard that, I thought it was pretty cool because I thought, well, I don't want to stay in a job longer. I want to keep getting promoted. And that's what happened the first few times. And then I completely lost my job and I was in my first job search that I hadn't planned. And uh, it, it was really a painful place to be in. I've talked to people who have been in, medi- in middle to senior management uh, or um, you know senior technologists at their organizations, and everybody kind of knows. It's kind of like the pink elephant in the room. Everybody knows that there isn't necessarily job security. No matter the industry, size of company, how, how great the company is doing, you never know if you're going to be there in you know one to three years from now. So here's kind of my overall big take on this. As a manager, I assume that you have a certain level of technical proficiency. Like that's just an assumption. And if I go high, if I interview people for a new job and I'm down to my last three to five people that I'm interviewing, they will all have a certain level of technical proficiency. Beyond that, it's whether I want to work with them whether I would be proud, whether I would feel confident putting them in front of customers, and that could be internal or external customers. So beyond what you bring to the table, aside from your technical chops, I'm really looking at the whole you and trying to figure out if you're going to be an asset to my team or if you're going to be kind of cancerous and kind of ruin the morale and all of the stuff that I've been trying to build on my team that almost becomes more important than whether you can do this particular uh, function or job or not, because I can teach some of the technical stuff. I could probably teach a lot of the technical stuff, especially with with resources like Pluralsight, but some of that, that, uh, the interpersonal uh, skills and the soft skills, those are harder to teach. Now, you've done a lot of things that are designed to kind of help someone be more valuable and, and do better in their current job too. Uh, you finished up a two-parter on being a better mentor and being a better mentee. Uh, I believe you've done a course on on better working on a team as as well as just some some kind of prioritizing your time and tasks and managing your time type of thing. Tell me how that's something that that could really benefit just about any kind of professional. Well, I think nowadays we're going to be on teams. 
we're going to be in a situation where we have a whole lot of things to do and we have to decide um, what what the priorities are. And at the end of the day, um, that we have we have so much autonomy. It, it, whether we're on a team, whether in a big a big company or small company, we can really decide how we're going to run our schedule and uh, and who we interact with and how we interact with them and stuff like that. If we make good choices as far as what we work on and how we communicate with others and how we listen to others and, and how we participate in, in meetings and all of those things, people are going to notice that. Like I said, the the technical stuff is a given. People, a lot of times, what I've seen is there's a lot of stereotypes in IT with developers or sysadmins or whatever. There's all kinds of stereotypes. And I, l- let me give you an example of myself. I've been told over the years since I started my own company, people say, man, I really didn't think that a programmer would be able to start or run a business. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm looking at myself as a whole person and I know what my strengths and weaknesses are. But when people find out that I used to be a developer, they automatically stereotype me and put me in to, uh, into some kind of brand or some kind of bucket, assuming, for example, that I'm not really good with people, that I'm not going to be able to get up on a stage and talk. There's all these assumptions that I've had to break through, and that a lot of that has really had to do with how I interact with other people. So you know how the average corporate employee kind of reacts when they're sent to sensitivity training or, or diversity training or whatever it is. I mean, we, we all know there's a valuable things and we all know it's, it, it's extremely important. We get that. But at the same time, it's like, oh, we have to do sensitivity training again. Yeah. How, how does this professional development stuff, how, how should someone think differently about this? That, that this is something that's maybe more important to you and less so your employer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember at one organization, a government organization that I was with, we were compelled. We, we had to go to those meetings. And it wasn't about whether you learned anything or not. It was just being compliant that you sat in a one hour or a four hour training or whatever it was. That When we're talking about professional development, I, I think the whole model of education has shifted. So for example, if somebody tells me they want to be a developer, I say, go get a, a Pluralsight subscription because you're going to get the best and deepest and most current training from there as opposed to getting a CS degree. And, and I'm not down on universities or college or whatever, but I remember when I was taking my programming courses, uh, somebody somebody made the comment that the, the version of Visual Basic that we were learning was already three or four years outdated. Ouch. Well, car- carry that over to the professional development world. Whenever I've had to go to any of those classes, it was kind of a, okay, here's a whole bunch of people in the room that don't want to be here. We don't see how this is necessarily applicable to us. And uh, I have a whole lot of other things that I really need to do. I got deadlines. I have other things weighing on my mind. This isn't fun. It's not my choice. So there's a big difference between that and stepping back and saying, okay, in order to get the get to where I want to be this year or in the next three to five years or whatever, what are the things that I need to do? And you can easily break those down into the technical things that you want to learn. But you can also say, you know what? I, this is really hard to admit, but I know that I'm not a good listener, or I know that I come across abrasive or something that has to do with a soft skill. When you're looking at where you're going to be in one or three or five years, and you're thinking, how can I improve so that I can really work towards or get the things that I want out of my career, it's a completely different reason than, than being compelled to go sit in an auditorium with a bunch of other people that don't want to be there. Now, you've also done a, a number of courses. Well, I, I actually looking at the list, I was going to say that are Kind to Management 101, but that's actually literally the name of one of the courses that, that are a little bit about getting started in maybe not management, but leadership. So it, 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 I, I guess I kind of think of somebody's career or their job as, as a little bit of a life cycle. You, you get the job. That's great. You start the job. You kind of learn to work with your colleagues. But at some point, many people do want to start moving up the chain. What are some of the just quick highlights that you try to teach someone in that that management 101 type of course? 
So let me just differentiate real quick between the two courses. One is leadership getting started, which is more on vision and strategy. And then there's the management 101. And what I really wanted to help people do is understand that if they do want to go the management route, and some people do think they do, and then they get there and they're like, man, this is horrible. Get me out of here. Um, <laughs> th- there's a whole new set of skills and um and knowledge that you should have. So for example, as a developer, I never had to think about P&L, uh, profit and loss or financials. But when I became a manager, I all of a sudden had this monthly sheet that I was staring at, looking at all these figures that kind of made sense to me. They were, they were kind of intuitive, but there were certain things that I had to go to the controller or the accountant and say, okay, this doesn't make sense. Why is this? And then she would explain in, you know, in her controller way, Um, well, actually, this is how the numbers work, and this is why it's all very logical. So there are a number of things that we can intuitively jump into as far as management goes, but there are simply a lot of things that we've never had exposure to. And so that's what the Management 101 course is. It's an introduction to a lot of the things that you would be faced with if you're a manager, how to manage people and personnel issues, as well as how to manage uh, operations and scheduling and all of those other things that you really have never had to think about before you became a manager. And and I guess the last thing I want to hit is, and this is a smaller section of our courses, but what, you've done several in this area, and I know it's one of, of particular professional interest to you, and that's for the time when, when you finally do have to go find that new job. Maybe you've been laid off or or even fired, or you've just decided it's time to move on. And, and tell me a little bit about how you approach that, that talking to people about becoming and being a job seeker. Well, it, it's pretty easy. Most of the time people approach me because there are so many people who have found that there is no such thing as a 20 or 40 year career anymore. People are, are in transition pretty regularly. And so um, the first thing that I do when somebody says they lost their job or they got laid off or whatever is I say, hey, congratulations, because <laughs> this, this really could be the start of something great for you. And uh, you might have been in some kind of rut at your old company, and this is a great time for a fresh start. And so it's a time to do a little bit of introspection. You can start to look at different industries or different companies that you never really have thought about before. So it's, it really is an exciting time. Um, when I do my presentations, my in-person presentations on career management, it really breaks down to two different things. They're, they're, they're just two main things. One is networking. And I know that's kind of like a four-letter word for a lot of people. They're like, I don't want to oh, go yeah. network. And, it's, and it seems very superficial. And it was hard for me to network. I thought networking was a numbers game where I had to hand out a lot of business cards and I had to meet X number of people. And, and I'm actually an introvert, so it's kind of hard for me to do all that. But one day I was reading a book called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And I mentioned that in the course, uh, or multiple courses, actually. And anyways, in Never Eat Alone, I started to understand... That networking wasn't necessarily about numbers. It was actually about one-on-one individual relationships. And as an introvert, I don't have a problem with one-on-one individual relationships. I I actually like people. I like to learn about them and, and figure out how I can help them. And I started to change my idea on what networking really was. Instead of this high quantity thing, it became much more of a quality thing. And it's interesting that when I shifted my own strategy, things actually started to fall into place. I I, I wasn't on this superficial level with a lot of people. I was on a deeper level with a smaller number of people, but the deeper level uh, is where I started seeing some results. The other thing in the job search that I think is really important is what we used to call reputation, how, how people perceived us and what they thought of us and how they would talk about us. The buzzword for the last 10 years or so has been personal brand. I know some sure. people have had a hard time with with the, the phrase personal brand, but whether you want to call it reputation or personal brand, the idea is who knows what about you? And so let me, let me just introduce this really cool concept called the hidden job market. And there are books on this and seminars and stuff, but the hidden job market is simply this. You're sitting at your cubicle or in your office and somebody comes to you, your boss maybe, and says, hey, we just got approved for two new positions. Nobody knows about this yet. Who do you recommend? 
that's it. That's the hidden job market. So as a job seeker, what we want to do is have that person who is in that conversation say, oh my gosh, I know Jason Alba, you need to go talk to him. Well, that's only going to happen if people have, have know me and they know something about me and they feel comfortable recommending me. That all goes back to networking, our relationships, our personal brand. And I know it sounds like it's a little overboard to do when you're not in a job search, but I'll tell you what, my job search came out of the blue. I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't anticipating it. It just happened one day. Next thing you know, I have no job and I didn't have a network and I didn't have a brand and it took me a while to figure all that stuff out. The drum I like to be is to tell people, you need to work on this right now. Start working on it right now. And it doesn't mean you have to be a crazy networking fool that goes to everything. And it doesn't mean that you have to try and shake everybody's hand and all that stuff, but just start developing relationships and think about how you want people to perceive who you are. Those two things together, uh, as you work on those two things daily or weekly or monthly, you're getting closer and closer to being a part of the hidden job market before you need to, be, before you need to look for a job. So, so job seeking skills are really a little bit like an insurance policy. You, you don't want to wait until the house is burning down before you go buy one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and nowadays there's a lot of houses that are burning down. And I'll tell you I'll tell you what, Don. Here's the thing. I know a lot of people are listening to this thinking, you know, I'm expert in this, I'm really good at that, but I'll tell you what, there were tens of thousands of people who were expert at Enron and, or Enron suppliers. And That's overnight, true. Outside of their control, regardless of how great the economy was or how good the, the company was doing, everything just dried up. And I've seen different situations. The people that come to me and that come to my website uh, for job search help ranges from CXO level, you know, o almost owners of companies. I actually have talked to some owners of companies that had legal problems, so they weren't able to own their company anymore. All the way down to the very bottom, there is a host of reasons that are outside of our control that might cause us to go look for a new job. And I'll, it's, it's a lot more fun when you have your brand and your relationships than when you don't have that. So you mentioned your website. Uh, what is that website? And, and is, is that where people should go if they want to find you online? Or, or is, it, is it Twitter or something else for you? So jibberjobber.com. Sounds like jibberjabber, but it's jibberjobber.com. And it's an organizer for uh, an online organizer for your job search. And that's really the main place I am on Twitter. I don't check it very often. But uh, jibberjobber.com and jason at jibberjobber.com is the main contact. Great. Well, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, hopefully, giving people a little bit of, uh, of room for thought and uh, maybe some new courses to watch using their Pluralsight subscription. Thank you.